Good morning. I am Pastor David here at Forest Hills Church, where we love, grow, and serve. We love God and others. We grow in Christ, and we serve by the leading and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's Sunday morning, March 29th, and we're gathering here for worship, but we're not gathering together for worship. Instead, we're gathering remotely for worship. And although we are here in what we call God's house at the Forest Hills Church building, we know that God's house belongs to the whole world. And so you are also in God's house right now. You are with God's presence. And by connecting here in worship, we are making that body of Christ join together because Jesus promises that His Spirit will connect us all together. So this morning we worship. And we lift God our praise and our focus. And because of our, the needs of our world, we must come to God in worship. And we cling to Him as our lifeblood and our way of flourishing to live fully. We love God and we also love others. So we come before God to lift God the needs of our world and our community and ask God to send us out in ways to go be light and leaven for our world. We need to ask God how to do that in our times of social distancing. And so we have a bunch of resources here as a church. We want to um, have us all do together, watch the videos that we are producing for devotions, for worship, for group time, to join together in um, on social media groups, connect with, with, with your neighbors, maybe give some, give some help to someone else who's in need that, who can't get out and get some help. We also have um, this morning's worship um, for, for adults, and kids, we, we can't do, by copyright issues, the um, kid part of our, of our service. So instead, we want you guys to connect to the kids' video that Miss Sue has recorded for you to play as well this week. So go on our church website. You can find that video for kids, um, and you'll see the, uh, the, the um, video for you kids to connect with God today as well. So we go to our memory verse for today, and that is the verse that we are using for our whole journey during Lent. We're on a journey to the, to the cross of Jesus and to a life of living, of the discipleship that God has planned for us. And so our memory verse is Jeremiah 31, 21, and it goes like this. Set up road signs, put up guideposts, take note of the highway, the road that you take. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead that with you. So repeat after me. Set up road signs, put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Jeremiah 31, 21. Good morning. I'm Amanda Lucas here at Forest Hills Church. Thank you for joining us for worship. Um, we know that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, whether it be physically or virtually like we are today, he is there with us. Um, we are going to get right into worship this morning and dust off an oldie but a goodie, the Lion of Judah.
this. Absolutely.
pray with me? Heavenly Father, we experience your goodness every single day. Even when it feels like our world is crumbling around us, we pray for your protective hand, your healing hand. You are the great physician. Guide us in the one way you want us to go. In your holy name, amen. For our prayer time to today, I want us to have a connection to the whole body of Christ, the church universal. We are, we are staying at home a lot more. We are secluded. We're not able to get out as much as, as we used to. And so I think it's important for us during this time to, be, to connect with the wider church. So our, for our prayer time, I've gone to my book of worship, and in here are prayers written for Lent by Christians throughout the world in the last hundred years. I'm going to read parts of these prayers of voices of people from around Christ's church that connect us together and use this as a prayer time to journey in Lent together and journey with the body of Christ together. We are one. We are connected. We are under the head of Jesus Christ all together. We may be separated. We may be remote, but we are still one together. So as we go to our God in prayer today, a prayer who hears, a God who hears all of our prayers, wherever we are at, you remember that. God hears your prayer in your house when you are alone. God hears your prayers. Your house is a house of, of, of prayer. So we're going to go to these prayers offered by God's people from all over the world. Would you pray with me? O oh God, your glory is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Your blessed Son is led, was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan. Come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let, us, let each one find you mighty to save. Because of your tender mercy toward all people, you sent your Son, Jesus, as our Savior, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. And all should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Grant us grace to feel and to lament our share of the evil that has made it necessary for Jesus to suffer and die for our salvation. Help us in this time of self-denial and prayer and meditation to, to prepare our hearts for deeper penitence and a better life. Help us so to keep fast, the, to keep the Lenten fast that you have given for us as a blessing that we may loose the bonds of of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free. All this we pray, deeply in the strong name of Jesus, the giving us who, the one who gave us a freedom from our sin and deliverance as our Redeemer. Amen. It is important to keep worshiping God through prayers, through music, through word, through the Bible reading, and through fellowship. It's also very important to keep worshiping through giving. I want to encourage you to give now in ways that you don't always think about. Perhaps there's a neighbor that you could go give some help to. Maybe you can offer some child care. Maybe you can offer some supplies that, are, that are, are, are needed. How are those around you? We also want you to continue to encourage you to keep giving of yourself to this church's life and ministry. We are launching all kinds of ways that we are getting into our community to offer the light, the light of Christ and the hope to a world that really needs God right now. And as we are staying apart and separate, don't forget that the financial costs continue for God's work and God's church. So I want to urge you to find creative ways to keep giving to God's work, both on your own and through this church here. You can give through our church website. Go to the church website. Click on the giving section. Give remotely. You can give through direct deposit. You can give through one-time one transfers. You can set up automatic withdrawals from your account. 
You can give on your credit card. You can also give in person. You see, you can swing by the church and drop off your giving. Please, we need you to keep giving because God's work continues. And in fact, God's work is all the more important now at times like this. Our community is listening. Our community is turning to the church saying, what hope do you offer? And we want to offer the hope and the, and the help of, Je- of Jesus Christ. And that begins with what you do. Hi, I'm Cassie Betker, the Director of Youth Ministries here at Forest Hills Church. And I have the honor and the privilege to be able to continue today's Lenten message with Signs for Life, Learning to Navigate for Spiritual Living. We have been going through road signs, which you can see behind us. And today we are starting with One Way. But before we get started, let's do our liturgy. I will read the leader one. Read with me as we read the people one to get started. We are on the journey of Lent. God has given us road signs for the journey. We are on the journey of life. God has given us road signs for the journey. Jeremiah 31, 21 says, Set up road signs, put up guideposts, take note of the highway, the road that you take. Stop. Stop to discern your journey. Stop to reorientate your lives. Stop sinning. No outlet. So many paths in life lead to nothing. We come to see clearly. Speed limit. God's timing is always right. We must take care not to travel along our path of life faster or slower than God has planned for us. Do not enter. We stick to God's path with perseverance. We keep fast to the center. Yield. We let God have his way. We produce a harvest. One way. God's way is better. We turn around and choose it. We come to see the road signs God has placed for our life's journeys. Steve and Lily are huge Frank Sinatra fans. When Lily was younger, she would make that over 50 crowd smile ear to ear as she walked through the grocery store, loudly singing Summer Wind. But his most well-known song goes something like this. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friends, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. That song seems to characterize the world in which we live. When I think about God's plans for me, I picture empty nesting in a year, spending weekends out on our boat, getting my pastoral license, and getting some travel in. Now, these are all good gifts, and there's nothing immoral or wrong about wishing for a comfortable life in the right context. In fact, we should pray that God blesses us and his people. The problem arises when we wish for such temporary things more than the ultimate joy received with a life focused on Christ. We often want God to be our life coach rather than our Lord. We want a pastor to give us a three, five-point sermon on an easier life, all the while forgetting that our mission is to exalt God. Instead of letting his glory shape our desires and ambitions, we too often expect him to reveal his minute-by-minute instructions for our lives. We crave the personal comfort of knowing our destined five-year plan over faithfully trusting him with our future. Obviously, we see this attitude among non-Christians, but we also find it among Christians as well. I remember a time when a Christian friend came to see me. She wanted some advice and was contemplating doing something that she knew was against the Bible. And in the end, her response was, I know this is wrong, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to do it anyways. That sounds a whole lot like Frankie, doesn't it? I did it my way. There are apparently a lot of Christians who believe in doing things their ways these days. Articles reporting that about a third of all American Christians say that premarital sex is okay, and about 15% say that adultery is okay even though the Bible says these things are clearly not okay. It seems that a lot of Christians are singing it with Sinatra, I did it my way. I understand this desire to do it my own way. Once I learn to do something, it's the only way I know how to do it. This goes especially for driving directions. Take going to Red Rock Camp, for instance. I have gone there for over 25 years on the same roads in the same way every time. Up until a few years ago, When I was so focused on getting to camp, 
that I wasn't really paying attention until some honking started in front of me, and I realized that the road I was taking had become a, a one-way due to road construction, and I was going the wrong way. But sometimes our way is going down the wrong way in a one-way. Has no one else done that? Okay, maybe it's just me on that story, but I know you can relate to this. Maybe your story isn't going down the wrong street, but I'm hoping your story doesn't end like Jonah's either. Most of us have heard the story of Jonah before, right? Generally, when we hear stories that we've heard so many times before, we tend to phase them out and let our mind wander on things. I obviously get this way while driving too. But the book of Jonah is of such a story. All of us have heard it. We know how God wanted to send Jonah to Nineveh, but Jonah ran from God, he got swallowed by a big fish, and then he finally went anyways. He preached to the people of Nineveh, and they repented, and God saved that city from destruction. That's the story we've been told, and that's the story we know. Now, teens, pay close attention. We're going to deep dive into Jonah come May. But before we dive into the story, let's get some historical settings around Jonah. Jonah is a prophet in Israel in about the 8th century B.C., it was a good time for Israel. In fact, Jonah is a well-known and well-respected prophet. We call this book one of the minor prophets, yet it only contains one prophecy. It is really a book about Jonah and God. We know that our Lord loved this story because Jonah is the only minor prophet that Jesus mentions by name. In 2 Kings 14.25 says that God restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabath, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah. Jonah had prophesied that Israel would expand her boundaries, and look, now it had. There was excitement in the air. Maybe now God was going to bless Israel and let it finally become the most prominent nation in the known world. On top of this, Israel was in the beginning stages of an economic boom that they had not seen since the time of King Solomon. So Jonah was a celebrity. He had strong nationalistic tendencies, and on top of that, he was patriotic. He had God on his side. Jonah was a prophet of God, and was, God was using Jonah to give Israel everything it had ever wanted. Things were going quite smoothly, or so the people thought. Then Jonah's world was turned upside down when he received a message from the Lord. Let's read Jonah 1, 1 through 2. The Lord's word came to Jonah, Get up and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their evil has come to my attention. There was only one real problem during this time period. Israel was a great nation, but over in the east, across the desert, another nation, Assyria, was beginning to grow far stronger than Israel. The capital city of Assyria was Nineveh. The Assyrians and the people of Nineveh in particular were notorious throughout the region for showing no mercy to their enemies. They were known for doing some awful things to their victims, killing people, in, uh, they conquered their cities by the thousands, and then stacking up their bones in piles outside the city gates. If you really want to know more about how awful it was, sit down and read the book of Nahum. He goes into vivid detail about how the people of Nineveh treated their enemies. It wasn't pretty. And Jonah knew this. He knew that these are awful, nasty people and that they had become the sworn enemies of Israel. And he also knew that we'll find out later that if he went there and preached this message, that the Ninevites would repent. And he knew that God would forgive them. And Jonah wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted them to be destroyed. He wanted them to be wiped off the face of the earth. He wanted justice and condemnation to be poured out on his enemies. Jonah decided that he knew better than God did. Let's read Jonah 1, 3. So Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship headed to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went ab aboard to go with them to Tarshish, away from the Lord. Jonah did the only thing he could do. He ran. And he tried to run as far away as he could. Nineveh is to the north and east of Joppa, where Jonah was. It's about 550 miles away. 
But Jonah goes in the completely opposite direction from Nineveh. Scholars generally agree that Tarshish was in modern-day Spain, and it was as far as Jonah could go. This was considered the ends of the earth. He had taken things into his own hands and decided that he should go in the complete opposite direction from where God was leading him. We know how the story goes, right? Jonah boards a boat, probably manned by people who happen to know nothing about the Lord. A great storm comes, threatens the boat. It's such a terrible storm that it causes these seasoned sailors to panic. They started throwing over cargo and throwing out whatever prayers they could to whatever deities they could think of. They finally went and woke up Jonah and told him to pray to his God. It was ultimately revealed that Jonah was the reason that they were in such a mess. And they agreed with the prophet that they should throw him overboard. Before they did, however, they prayed, Please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. It's a sad thing, isn't it? When people who have nothing to do with the Lord show more compassion than someone who is a man of God. So they throw Jonah overboard. And as soon as he hits the water, the sea goes calm. And God sends a great fish to swallow Jonah. Many people assume it was a whale of some type. But there's no hint in the text here to really tell us what it was. All we know is that God is God. And he can use whatever means he chooses to get our attention even if it means living in the belly of a fish for three days. At this point, we need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. We have the sea, the wind, the thunder, the great fish, and even the heathen sailors who didn't know the Lord at all, all obeying God. All of them did what the Lord had commanded and were used by him. On the other hand, here's this man of God, the one who had given the Lord a voice to his people, and he was doing everything he could to get out of it. Because Jonah had decided that what he wanted was more important. So the story continues. Jonah cries out to the Lord, and after three days, the fish spits Jonah out onto dry land. And Jonah starts walking to Nineveh. It's about a month-long journey at this point, and he arrives at the city, probably still smelling like fish. He arrives at his destination, and he preaches a sermon that's only five words in Hebrew. It translates to this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And when the people of Nineveh heard this, they were cut to the heart and believed in the Lord. Every one of them, from the king of Nineveh down to the lowest servant, even their animals. The people fasted and wore sackcloth as a sign of city-wide repentance and asked God for his forgiveness. And God spared them from destruction. I heard this story countless times as a child. And I have to admit, it wasn't until I was an adult that I discovered that the story of Jonah doesn't end there. It doesn't end with Nineveh's repentance. I think that's how we wish it had ended. Though it, how this story ends is a little bit different than our children's Bibles. It would be much easier if the story ended here. It would definitely preach, right? Jonah brings goes running from God, he goes running towards God, he ultimately runs with God, and we remind ourselves that we can't outrun God. Nice three-point sermon, good stuff, but it wasn't the end. But there's one more chapter, and in it we discover that Jonah still doesn't get it. We also did that discover that Jonah kind of has a dark side. He thinks following God is really all about providing his own comforts and his own desires. Because he isn't getting what he wants, Jonah becomes very angry, and he threw himself a little temper tantrum. Let's read it here in Jonah 4. But Jonah thought this was utterly wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Come on, Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. I know that you are merciful and a compassionate God very patient, full of faithful love, and willing not to destroy. At this point, Lord, you may as well take my life from me, because it would be better for me to die than to live. The Lord responded, Is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a shrub, and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. 
Jonah was very happy about the shrub. But God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked the shrub so that it died. Then, as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, It's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, Yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, You pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise. It grew in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Earlier, the sea, the wind, the thunder, the great fish, the heathen sailors. Now we add in the Ninevites, their servants, their animals, the leafy plant, the worm, the hot wind. They all obeyed God's commandments. But Jonah, he still didn't. He was convinced that he was the one in the right and God was in the wrong. He was really singing, I want it my way. But remember that this is God's story. Jonah is not the hero of this story. At the beginning, he is running from God, and at the end, he is arguing with God. And in between, he's praying and he's preaching. But he's no hero. In fact, he's kind of an anti-hero. This book is about God, and we can see it really clearly. The fish is only mentioned four times in the book. The city is mentioned nine. Jonah is mentioned 18 times. And God is mentioned 38 times. But gosh, aren't we Jonah? We don't really want to accept God's authority in our lives. Who ultimately do we want directing our path? Do you want it to be God, who knows what our final destination is? Or do you want it to be you or me, who sometimes aren't even going on the right road or in the right direction? If we want God to direct our paths, we've got to seek his will and do things his way. So what is your Nineveh today? Nineveh is whatever pulls you out of your comfort zone. Nineveh is the place God calls you where you don't want to go. I wonder how many times we have turned following Jesus into something that's just supposed to be comfortable. We pray things like, I hope you send someone to help out with the famine in Africa. But we hesitate to lift a finger to do anything to help. We acknowledge that the only way to get people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is to start a relationship. But secretly, we think missionaries that have gone to countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan are kind of idealists and maybe a little crazy. Deep down, we think, I'm glad they're over there and not me or my child or my grandchild. I don't want to make that kind of sacrifice for my life. Nineveh is that place that God calls you where you don't want to go. Nineveh is danger. Nineveh is discomfort. Nineveh is whatever you hate that God loves. He desires for us, his desire for us is better than anything we could possibly imagine, even when it seems painful. So Jonah decides to run from God. He heads to Joppa where he just happens to find a boat. What are the chances? Isn't this an amazing coincidence? It's a long way from Joppa to Tarshish. It's not like they had a boat leaving every day. But when you decide to disobey God, there is always a boat going in the opposite direction. When we decide to run from God, Satan is happy to provide our transportation. Think about the times we choose to disobey Jesus because of convenience. How many times have you chosen to talk about someone who's wronged you instead of going to that person? But Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 to deal with that person directly. How many times do we actually do this? How many times do we avoid it because we just don't want to? When we do that, we're committing the same sin as Jonah. We're announcing to the world that we know it the way better than God. The last question that God asked Jonah kind of dangles in the air, and it cuts right at our hearts. Jonah cared more about that plant than he did about the Ninevites who were condemned because of their wickedness. When we are more concerned about material things and our own personal comfort than we are about our neighbors, we are walking in darkness. Something is very out of alignment. We don't allow our hearts to break for things that break God's heart 
we are announcing that we know better than God, and we are no better than Jonah. People may think we're crazy sometimes. Our friends may not understand, and I'm sure other Hebrews were really upset with Jonah for going and preaching to their enemies. But there is something more important than merely getting the approval of our neighbors. Jesus needs to shine through our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to look back on my life and wonder what would have happened if I had followed Jesus and didn't keep him at arm's length. When things get uncomfortable or undesirable, I don't want to say no. I don't want to be known as a Jonah, only living out my faith when it's convenient and it makes me happy. The truth of the matter is, no matter how much we want to think that it isn't the case, following the Lord really isn't about me. It's not about you either. It isn't even about this church building or the lack of being in a building or programming or the lack of programming at this instance in our lives. It's all about him. And it's all about his beauty and his grace and his majesty. He has willingly showered this upon us. It's all about his ability to change a wreck like me and adopt me as his child. Because God is God. And you and I, we're not. God told Jonah to do a certain thing, and Jonah disobeyed. He did not do what God told him to do. God viewed these actions as not trusting him and honoring him as holy. God was with Jonah every step of the way. Though Jonah tried to leave the Lord, the Lord never left him. If you're going down the wrong way, on a one way, and it's not in the right direction, God is there honking at you. He is saying, wake up and go in the right direction. Amen. Please join us for our closing song. We're, we're not going to rock out for the end of our service strong enough to save because you know what? We're all, we all have a little bit of Jonah inside of us and quite frankly, we need to know which way to go.
go through our memory verse one more time. Set up road signs. Put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to check out our website for any handouts. There's a bulletin in there, um, daily devotionals, any inspiration that you need during these troubled times. So let's close. Father, we ask you to help us read our map this morning. You have given us your word, the Bible, as a roadmap for our life. You have given us your son, Jesus, who told us he is the way. You have given us your Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promised will lead us into all truth. For all you have done for us and all you will do today, we praise you and thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.